Well, good morning. How are you guys this morning? Good? Good, good. Well, I brought some things with me, um, and I thought you might be able to tell me how I can use them. Does that sound good? Okay. Let's see. What, what can I use these things for? I have some cleaning wipes and a sponge and some bathroom cleaner and some paper towel. What are some things that, what can I do with these things? Yeah. I can clean stuff, right? I can clean things. I can wash and clean things that are in my house. Um, do you ever help your mom by cleaning your house? Yeah? Yeah? Um, well, when I was your age, my mom would always tell us that my house needed to be cleaned, and I never believed her because I always thought it looked fine. Um, but she would ask me to clean the house. And so um, what I've done as I've gotten older is I made a list of things um, that when these things happen, um, I know that it's time to clean the house. Can I read that list to you? Okay. It's time to clean your house when your feet stick to the floor when you walk through the kitchen. It's time to clean your house when your mom can't find you when she comes into your room to wake you up in the morning. It's time to clean your house when your friends come over and they use their fingers to write, wash me, on your windows. It's time to clean your house when there are more dishes in the sink than there are in the cupboard. And it's time to clean your house when you have so much stuff under your bed that even the dust bunnies don't want to go under there. <laughs> well, okay, maybe I don't ever let my house get that bad, and I'm sure that your house does never get that bad either, but the truth is, is that we all need to clean our house or our rooms sometimes, right? Right. Okay, well, our Bible story today tells us about a time when even Jesus wanted to clean house. And um, it happens when Jesus comes to um, Jerusalem during the Passover, and he comes into a temple, and he walks in the church. And it kind of is like this, right? He walks in the church, and he sees people selling cows and, and sheep and birds and trading money. And he gets really mad, kind of like your mom when you don't clean your room, right? He gets really mad. So he takes and he lets all the animals out and he flips over the table and he tells everyone to get out of his house, get out of his father's house. And they do, because it looked more like a flea market, more like a store than a church. Well, Jesus didn't like what he saw and um, as he was cleaning the temple, um, it reminded me of something. When Pastor was talking about it just a few minutes ago, it reminded me of something. The Bible says, and I want you to listen really closely, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, the Bible says that we are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Right now, we are in a very important season of our church year. We are celebrate, or we're in Lent. And Lent is a really good time for us to think about that and to look inside our hearts and see what needs to be cleaned out. And Jesus, and remember that Jesus did that all for us on Easter. Okay, now we're going to pray, but what I want you to do is the, today and the next few days, I want you to think really hard about the things that maybe you can work on. Maybe it's cleaning your room when your mom and dad say so, or maybe it's remembering to to listen to your teachers or to pray before you go to bed. But I want you to take one thing and work on it this week. Can you do that for me? Good. Okay, let's fold your hands and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for coming and cleaning our hearts. We are so glad that you forgive us every single day. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our texts are taken from all three of our readings, Exodus chapter 20, 1 Corinthians 1, and John chapter 2, as read a few moments ago. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ. 
What should you expect from church? Notice I'm not asking what do you want in a church. That's an entirely separate question. But what should you expect from church? Now I venture to guess that if you ask ten people what they expect from church, you're most likely to get ten different answers. But if you were to ask God what you should expect from his church, you're likely to get one clear answer. And that answer is placed before us in our readings for today. First, I would like to examine what not to expect from church. Jesus in the Holy Gospel teaches us that God's church is not a marketplace of ideas where salvation is bartered, bought, and sold, where profits and losses run the show, where money changers get the prime locations in the narthex, where the budget gets more airtime than the Bible. God's church is the body of Christ. Therefore, It is as good as it is connected to Jesus Christ. Realizing this, what then can or what should we expect from church? A church centered on Christ should constantly be about studying the word of Christ found in Holy Scripture. And there are a number of opportunities here at Mount Calvary for us to do this. And we hope to add more into the future. You see, my friends, the Bible is meant to be meditated upon. It is meant to be read, marked, learned, and inwardly digested. And when we inwardly digest God's word, one of the first things we find is the law of God. Now, the law, the purpose of the law, is very quite simple. The purpose of the law is to drive us to Jesus Christ. If we do not recognize our problem, we will not seek the solution. If we do not admit our sin, we will not hunger for a Savior. Only when we understand the depths of our sin can we truly appreciate the sacrifice of our Savior. We see a summary of God's law in our first lesson for today, the Ten Commandments. Now take a moment. Take a moment and think about these Ten Commandments. Now consider, consider how well you have kept those commandments. Beginning with the very first table of the law, our relationship with God. Have you feared, loved, and trusted in God above all things? Have you used the Lord's name in vain as a curse word to cover a lie? Or how about this one that we hear so much today, OMG? We all know what that stands for. That's the second commandment, folks. How about this? Have you gladly heard and learned God's word? Or do you dread coming to church, to Sunday school, to Bible study, or to confirmation? Do you feel you've gotten enough religion? Or do you hunger and thirst for more? And that's just the first table, folks. There's more. Now let's move on to the second table in our relationship with our neighbor. Have you honored, respected, and willingly obeyed the laws of the land and those in authority over you? Have you willingly obeyed your parents, the government officials, employers, 
pastors, teachers, even when you do not like them or like what they're doing? Do you hate another person or have you loved your enemies all the more when they have wronged you? Have you lusted after another even so much as a passing thought? Have you viewed your spouse as anything less than the child of God? They are. Or have you allowed your marriage to suffer for the sake of the lesser things of this world? Have you stolen, pirated music or movies, borrowing from work when you don't return, keeping what you found when you know that it really belongs to someone else? Have you harmed the reputation of another, whether by telling lies about them or speaking the truth about them when the truth did not need to be told? Have you coveted what is not yours or what you cannot have, harboring thoughts that you should chase away from your mind and your heart and your life? Absolute perfection. This is what God's law demands of us. And yet so often, so many people want to live by the law. They rejoice and they point to all their works. Look what I've done. At least I'm not like that person over there. And then they tend to overlook all the faults. God demands absolute perfection. If you want to live by the law, you have to live by all of the law. Every last point of the law. So have you kept all the law? Have you been perfect? Or have you fallen short? If you believe what you've that you've kept these commandments, then I've got to say that what I am about to say next will have little significance to you. If you do not recognize your sin, then you will have little need for a Savior from sin. And if you have little need for a Savior from sin, then the gospel message will mean nothing to you. But... But if you recognize your sin and believe that you deserve God's eternal wrath and punishment because of that sin, then God has a message for you today. And his message is this. Do not fear. Do not despair. Christ has come to carry the weight of your sins upon his shoulders. Because of his sacrifice, you will not know the wrath and the punishment of God. Because of his sacrifice, you will not know the depths of what your sin has earned for you. Because of his sacrifice, you are forgiven all your sins. Because of his sacrifice, you will live forever. This is the second thing. You should expect from God's church to hear that though we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the victory of eternal life has been won for us through the death and the resurrection of our perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you love a good manger scene? How many of you love to see all the cute little animals gathered around the tiny little baby Jesus? Likewise, people love precious moments, Jesus, sitting with the children and all, and tending to all the sheep. But it is dead on a cross, Jesus, that people often have a problem with. And yet this is precisely, this is precisely the Jesus the church is called first and foremost to preach about. We preach Christ crucified, St. Paul says. 
We hold Christ's pierced body before the world and worst of all, tell them that there is no other way to salvation than through Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ does not only show the incomprehensible grace of God, but also the immeasurable cost of sin. In our epistle lesson, St. Paul uses a term to describe the church's mission. It is Christ crucified. This expression is not unimportant. You see, St. Paul and the Holy Spirit, they knew the Greek language pretty well. And it's not coincidence, therefore, that the perfect tense is used here. In the Greek language, the perfect tense means an event that happened in the past, but has implications and continues to have impact into the present. Christ is the crucified one who still bears the marks of his crucifixion after his resurrection and for all eternity, and whose benefits still impact us today. Christ, who was crucified, is forever the crucified Christ. Just as Christ, who is raised, is forever the resurrected Christ. No amount of time, no amount of human reasoning or thought can ever change this fact. This is the good news of the gospel, which is to be proclaimed and distributed to those who have been crushed, who have been beaten down by the law. Proclaimed as the word is preached and distributed through holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. Scripture, law, gospel, Jesus. These are the unique and priceless gifts we as Christians offer to our world. American Idol can give some awesome vocal performances. Dancing with the Stars can give some fantastic dance moves. Dr. Phil can give great advice. Social clubs can give wonderful conversation. The YMCA can give fun sports programs. But we, Believers in Jesus Christ have God's holy word in law and gospel. We have Jesus Christ who casts out sin and grants eternal salvation through his own death and resurrection. Now we can gather the best singers in the world. We can brush up on our dance moves. We can certainly give great advice to those who are willing to hear. And we can have some marvelous conversations, or we can start a competitive sports league. Those are great things that we can offer and enjoy as members of Christ's body. But the scriptures, the law, the gospel, Jesus Christ, these are the things that make a church God's church. Whether or not to offer these things is, quite frankly, not an option. That is what God expects of his church. And that is what we need more than anything else in the entire world. It's rather funny how it works. What we need most is what God gives to his people in abundance, in and through Christ crucified. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus.